Okay. I'll start. Tim O'Donnell with Kono. Am I on? Yeah. Roy Rosenthal, Manager Springs. Terry Hayes, Town of Monument. Jim Moore at large, and much larger since Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Bowles, Park County. Donna Wood, Nepco. Warren Childers, Citizen at Large. Mighty Foster, El Paso County. Thank you. Jessica McMullen, PPACG, and then in the back. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but she can't vote. He cannot vote until she is appointed. Yes, okay. All right, good. All right, uh, we have on the consent of items, we have the agenda minutes and board report. Uh, the minutes and board report can stay on the consent agenda. We have to, or consent items, we have to pull off 5B and D, and they need to move up to the action items column under 4. So they would become 4, D, and E, I guess. So let's first of all. 5, B, and D move up to action items. And I'll remind everyone, as you hopefully saw in your emails yesterday, or on the front table, or where Jessica just handed it to you, the item that on your mail out was item 5A was moved to 4C. Uh, so there's a, <laughs> this is the second amended agenda. I'm lost. All right, so anyway, uh, let's... Uh, see if there are any uh, changes or edits to the minutes and the board financial report. Got to move for approval by Jim. Second. Second, <laughs> Second by whoever. Take your pick. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? I don't think there'd be anybody. All right. So the agenda... Uh, public comments. I don't think we have anybody to do public comments. We don't have any frequent flyers in here. Um, okay, action items. Let's start out with Catherine. Let's just follow ABC as it was under four, and then we'll jump to B and D from five. Let's go around. Let's all go together. Good afternoon, Catherine Wenger, Transportation Planner, PPACG. So every once in a while we get a request to amend our current TIP document. The TIP is our Transportation Improvement Program or our Short Range uh, Transportation Program, which lists all of the federally funded projects in the region and sometimes um, other regionally significant projects as well, depending on how significant they are, as the name states. So uh, we have been requested by CDOT and also PPACG has put in a request to amend our current TIP, which is the 2019 through 2022. The first amendment request is to add a project into fiscal federal fiscal year 2020, which st started actually in October of this year, and it's to add a US 24 West bridge replacement, and this is would be using federal funding source that goes to the Region 2, which is CDOT's Region 2 in the south uh, and southeast portion of the state and this is a bridge that is located on US 24 and the updated total cost would be 2.3 million dollars and this project was previously not in this document and so if CDOT has requested to add this and the second request is to reduce the funds um, that are currently listed in the TIP document um, for a statewide travel survey model project this mm -hmm. is something that was set aside to do travel survey models um, our surveys for our travel model, it helps improve our transportation model that provides um, updated ADTs for our forecasting. And we initially anticipated it be a million dollars from our region, um, but that um, amount has been reduced. And so we need to amend the tip just to reflect that we will not be providing as much money to CDOT for that statewide travel survey. And I can take any questions. Jim. I'm back. Uh, I'm geographically challenged. Okay. 
can you can you help me understand where mile marker 295 point whatever this is I can give you a rough <coughs> idea we were actually just talking about this it is going to be between Manitou and Woodland are actually Green Mountain Falls so it's somewhere in this vicinity right here I believe where this okay. this, okay. this separated highway portion yeah. um, it, unfortunately the map doesn't have mile markers and CDOT didn't provide more specific information there but I can try to get that a little more detail. I'm pretty there. sure that that mile marker is between Manitou Springs and Cascade in the windy part of the narrow part of the canyon oh, yeah. And there's a turn at, at the old Waldo Canyon parking lot. Um, there is a turnaround or a place where you can switch, and I think that's the bridge that we're talking yeah. about replacing. Yeah. Talking I about, think. Yeah. That sounds about right, what yeah. I remember. There's a box culvert that needs to get replaced, and I believe it's right here. Yeah. 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 I believe it's this one. Okay, so that, that 2.3 should cover design, soup to nuts, right? Design services and construction. Yep, it's both design and construction. Okay. Correct. All right. Any other questions? This is an action item, so I need a motion to approve. So moved. Okay. okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. Thank you. I don't know why I decided to stand up for this one. <laughs> um, Jessica McMullen, your policy and communications manager. Um, the 2020 legislative themes. Each year, the legislative committee of the board of directors um, establishes what they would like to see as the general guiding priorities for PPACG as they review legislation. Um, so within that, almost identical to what we did last year with, I think, two or three words tweaked, um, you saw the legislative themes document as your attachment. Um, you did also see last month the draft trifold that just kind of shows the pretty way we put it. Um, but this is what it is. The one thing that is not on your item but will be brought to the board um, that the legislative committee just finished talking about, about 255, 56. Um, they will also be asking the board of directors to support the concept of doing a study bill in 2020 on a road usage charge for electric vehicles. They want to do a study to ensure that all vehicles are paying an equal portion of their road use. So the committee is going to be asking the board to support that. Um, but the part I need your vote on is the legislative themes. I think one of the important things there is that uh, to oppose any unfunded mandates, um, the state gets real tricky when it comes to transportation things about, um, you know, trapping the county or the city into doing things by state law that they have no, that they aren't funding. So, you know, just saying that uh, that's a very important thing for our people up, up in Denver to watch for. Um, Jennifer, <laughs> was there any discussion about, or Jessica, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there any discussion about priorities? So if, if these themes, if any of these themes come into conflict with each other, in the course of the legislative session, uh, is there any thought about one outweighing another? There is not, and that is because the legislative themes are all equal priority to each other. Um, there is no way we can say transportation is more important than aging, or aging is more important than military support. Um, as the legislative committee reviews these, we look to see what the highest and best impact for and to PPACG is. Any other discussion? So this draft document that you sent us is what going to become final? Yes. That is what the board is being asked to approve as our final legislative themes for 2020. 
on December 11th. Plus, plus the and that is going to be a walk-on by the legislative committee. But I wanted the CAC to know about it. You guys should always know everything first. Um, we do not. Um, the average um, gas-powered vehicle pays about $160 a year um, in gas tax because of how long it's been, year or month. Do you know? Oh, it's got to be a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we pay so little in gas tax because it hasn't been updated in so long. Right now, electric vehicles pay zero. Sure. So we don't know the percentage of population that is in that. That's part of the study. But it's just making sure that Everybody doing its paying, using the roads. I move that we recommend approval to the board uh, of the uh, recommended themes with the addition that was briefed to us. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes. And the first amendment to your agenda, the moval of the nominating committee and officer status to an action item. Um, so our nominating committee, um, Tamara Dipner, Adam Resner, and Roy Rosenthal met <laughs> Monday to review the applications and to consider um, the requests for appointment and to go over those. Um, the, they have recommended the following slate. They have recommended Tim O'Donnell serve as our 2020 chair, Aubrey Day serve as the 2020 first vice chair, and John DeVoe serve as our 2020 second vice chair. Would you like to add anything, Roy? Uh, yes, we felt that we had four qualified people. Uh, we felt good about people moving up in position, and at the same time, a new person uh, in the for John DeBoa, second vice chair. Okay. Were there any other questions? We need a motion. I'm going to let Jessica drive this. Sorry. Because I have a uh, it, it, conflict. Because of he's on it. I'm. <laughs> Why can't Roy, as a committee rep, make the additional motion? Yeah, I'll make the motion that we approve the recommendations. And I'll second that. Okay. okay. Then Catherine gets to get back up here. So all in favor? Oh, yeah. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Didn't think so. Good. All right, now we are moving on to what is listed as 5B, the tip draft, 2124 tip draft. I apologize for all the sudden changes, but this combined meeting schedule confused me there. <laughs> so we have to get these items to um, the board in January to make sure they can get approved. So that's why they're moving up. So th this item is for the federal fiscal year 2021 through 24 tip. So you just approved an amendment to our current tip, which is the 19 through 22. Yep, 22. And so now we're getting ready to create the next document that will replace this one once this one has um, gone through. So we update that document every two years. And so just as a quick overview, since some of you might be a little new, but I want to just kind of go over what the tip is. So as the Pikes Peak Area Council Governments, we are the designated MPO, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization. And so we're responsible for maintaining our state, local, and federal transportation um, funds, that those federal funds for the region. And so we have to um, identify those funds in, a, in our TIP document, or our short-range plan. And it's a four-year document that we have. So the current one is 19 through 22. So the first two years will drop off. We'll roll forward the last two years of that document into this new one. And then we did a call for projects for the last two years, or for the um, new two years of the uh, document. So 23 and 24 had a call for projects to program additional funds that we anticipate having um, for the region. So we did a call for projects that ended in November, so it was about a month, month, month and a half long call for projects, and we received um, some six entities submitted projects, and then we held a project programming, uh, project prioritization workshop on November 6th to 
further refine the list based on um, project scoring and then um, member uh, prior priorities. So based on if they, even if their score was higher, sometimes the entity said, well, my this project is a higher priority in our um, jurisdiction. So we took that into consideration as well. And so what came out of that is we update the draft TIF document, which talks about policies and procedures and all the things that go in that are required of the document. And then we are required to have a listing of projects. And so what is in the attachment for our attachment actually two attachment one was a link to the draft document attachment two is just the list of the regional projects that were identified 21 and 22 were rolled over from the last one and 23 and 24 are those new tip years are those new tip projects and so, so, so these are just the new ones these are just the regional ones coming from Colorado Springs Manitou of those there's also state ones that are incorporated into this and that's at the link provided um, there's only a couple there because they're going to be coming back for a, um, a tip amendment because they're still working through that long range plan or for, through their process as well. So there's a simultaneous processes happening and they're not quite lining up as perfectly as we'd like. So you'll see another amendment to this new tip for the statewide projects. Um, but there are a couple that are already rolling forward in the document. So these ones are just the regional allocations, ones that we have control over programming the funds. I know that's all kind of weird, but <laughs> that's what those are. We also, um, in the link provided, there's also a listing of transit projects, which is selected and prioritized by Mountain Metro Transit. So those are the federally funded ones um, by Mountain Metro Transit. So there's three different project listings. There's the regional, the statewide, but are just in our region, and the um, transit in our region as well. So. What you're seeing now is a request for a, an approval to a recommended approval to the board to release this draft document to the public. So it's not approving the final document, it's just approving the 30 day public comment period that we're required to hold to, to let the public see these projects, comment, and let us know um, how they feel about this document. And then once that, once it goes through that process, It'll come back to the boards for, as an information item to let you know what kind of comments we received, if we made any changes. And then again, you'll see me come up here again after that month to let you know for, to get final approval. And then the planned um, final adoption, and then this, this new document would go into effect October 1 of 2020. So it doesn't go into effect straight away. Or actually, it would probably be July because CDOT works on a weird schedule too. <laughs> we have fiscal year, federal fiscal year, and calendar year. So, so I'll take any questions. I know that was a lot to, a lot to take in. Catherine, when, when do we go out to fill out the twenty? Was it twenty three twenty four? Yeah, twenty three twenty four uh, project entries. When do we put those in there? Yeah, they're already in there. So we we did a call for projects for uh, in October, okay. for and that was through TAC members are the ones that submit those projects. It, they have to be, um, you know. I stand corrected. <laughs> so yeah, those should, those should be in there. <laughs> yeah, I I have a question. And when is the public comment period, and how is that? Um, how is the public notified of that? Yes, the public comment will be in January once the board approves its release, so probably January 12th, because January 11th is the board meeting. And so we will have 30 days. We announce it in the newspapers, a traditional method, and then we also do it, release it on social media that they can comment on our website electronically. They could submit it via e our, uh, mail or email to me, or they can come in and comment to us. Um, so. It's through social media and the newspaper we announce and provide a link to the document for review. And I'll throw in a chime, and that's part of what our tech members do, is when we inform you guys about it in January, you can share with your members, friends, constituents, people who know you, that this is an opportunity for them to comment. And speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> And these are in no particular priority. Correct. Is this 
It is. Yes. It is an action act. Yes. Do we need to make a motion to approve this as presented? Yes, we do. Yes, I recommend approval to the board. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Let's move on to the 2045 LRTP draft mm -hmm. with public comments. This is my second item that I needed to move into action because we need to get this through the board as well. So over the last months, probably since June of this year, I've been providing opportunity for everyone, the committees and the public to review our long range transportation plan. This is, has an outlook of 25 years. So we do a long range plan that's for 25 years and then they identify projects from that long range plan to put into that short range tip document. So that's how those are connected. You must be in our long range plan in order to um, have projects programmed in our, in our short range plan. And so this is the draft document that went to the public and we received some public comments for this document. The main, we didn't really receive any um, formal public comments from the general public and we did provide, we went to a couple of, um, or excuse me, we held a couple of open houses and we provided opportunity online to um, to comment, but we didn't really receive any of those. We did receive some from El Paso County and Fountain and they wanted us to add a project that was privately funded and so it doesn't affect our, um, our financial uh, chapter at all. They wanted to add a South Powers extension study. And so this is to connect the remainder of this Powers Boulevard to I-25 in the south. And it's just a study to see what the best um, um, alignment would be and then potentially adding money for um, right-of-way acquisition. And a lot of this has to do with um, there's some developers that want to develop that area and we need to provide them kind of a corridor to kind of avoid so that we can maintain that area for a future powers extension. Um, and Fountain agreed with El Paso County that this project needed to be included in our long-range plan so that we could do this study long-term. And again, that would be privately funded. Uh, and then we also received another comment from El Paso County talking about placing a plan for a study that examines a limited access loop east of power, so an additional um, loop around to the east. And then again, this is a study, uh, and that would be regional in nature. And so for this, the P PACG staff response was that we do have a regional pool for studies already listed in our plan that identifies about $3 million for um, any studies, regional studies in the area. So we felt that this fit within that because that pool of money doesn't particularly identify projects. It just is a placeholder in case a project like this were to come up. So no money is actually identified. It's just said if we have some money, we would like to do this study. So we, we felt that that was already included in the plan. And then finally, we also received some comments from our federal highway partners, um, mainly just talking about l federal language and ensuring that it matches what they, they wanted to say. So that was just updates on my part to make sure that it's, um, it matches what they would like us to have in the federal language. And so we've made those updates as well. So what the motion here would be to recommend approval to the board of the final 2045 draft. So this would be the final approval of this draft as, as it is online. And it, with the additions? Yes, those additions have been made okay. based on the comments. Mm -hmm. Right. Any discussion? Questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, if this is approved, um, and then how often is it amended? Is that an annual update or is it a rolling or is it this is kind of the plan and we're going to stick with it in five years we look at it or what? So it is occasionally um, amended. It's a little bit more of a process than say the TIP because you have to go out to public process, especially if it affects the financial outlook that we have in there. So um, it occasionally happens. It probably I think we had two amendments to the last one. but. The plan lasts five years, and so we do full updates every four to five years based on air quality. 
we're um, in maintenance or no longer in air quality maintenance, so we have a five year outlook. And so we don't have to update it again for five years. But there is opportunity for amendment if we need to do that. Any other questions? <coughs> right, need a motion to move forward with the final draft slash final final. So moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. All right, now we can get to the informational stuff. Um, I think it's me again. <laughs> yeah, it's you again. Annual safety target setting. I think that's the only thing left, really, on the agenda. Right. Hopefully after the next couple months, you won't see me as often. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm pretty shy, actually, so this is <laughs> fun for me. Okay, so this is our annual safety target setting that we are required to do by uh, the federal re uh, regulations. So we have a certain number of performance measures that we have to set targets for, and some of them are four-year targets and some of them are one-year. The safety targets are annual. And as a Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, we have to, we have the option of setting our own regional targets for these measures or we can accept to support the state targets. Over the last few years we have um, decided to support the state targets because we felt that was the best way to uh, meet these requirements. Um, for one reason because we have issue with our data so it's hard to set targets in our region but also we feel that it still helps support the state targets which in turn helps our region as well because the state includes our region. Um, so the targets that we, that the state has set are um, for number of fatalities, fatality rate, number of serious injuries, serious injury rate, and then the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. So that's bicycle and pedestrian included the fatalities and serious injuries together. So those are the required measures. There is a um, I did provide a presentation as an attachment, um, as just background information, and I'm happy to provide, uh, go through any of those items in there. It just goes more into um, how this, the crash trends and the tech target setting requirements. Um, and then also it goes into our, the regional data as well, the PPACG crash trends. So this is where you can see the issue with our data actually in the serious injuries you can see the sharp decline from 15 to 16 and that's where we're having reporting issues um, so we didn't drastically do something <laughs> great there I don't think um, <laughs> unfortunately it's just the data there so we were kind of declining but now we're actually going on a more upward trend again now that we have more vehicles on the road traveling lo further longer distances so I'm happy to take any questions vehicles, thank you, more vehicles driving longer distances. <coughs> Has any of the effect of marijuana laws and legalizing marijuana and I think mushrooms also have effect on any of these crashes, especially maybe the, um, the less, the non-fatal rates? So have you guys measured that in any way? I'm sure when police do, do reports, they indicate there's alcohol or drugs are involved in the incident. We don't track that because it's not a part of the requirements for us, but it is, I think it's, they try to track that, but it's really hard to, is what I've been told is that it's hard to identify without a blood test if someone's been, you know, smoking or whatever the substance may be. Um, I've been told that it's hard to track that. So they're trying to, and there are, there are some um, data trends for that, I'm sure at the state level, but it's one of the harder ones to follow. But there are some at the at CDOT's website. They I think they have some of that information statewide. Um, these are state numbers, right? Their targets. The targets are statewide. So yes. if we approve state, but we can't approve our own area ones, then we don't know where they consider the problem areas to be. Um. Well, they have. These specifically are not. 
these are for the federal requirements, so that it's just for the these base measures. They also follow numbers. They do by region, and so each region region tracks where the problem areas are, and they have those identified, and they work on those statewide as well. So for this, no, we don't have the specific areas, but it's something that um, they do track as well as like a it's part of a separate program. <coughs> Is that something we get regularly here then, that we know what our area, how it's looking? Uh, we can. We, I think it was about last year we had a similar question mm -hmm. based on these, uh, and we had one of the CDOT people come in and talk about the trends, and I'm happy to ask him to come in again and do an update. It'd be nice maybe the first quarter to have an update in 2019, maybe. Sure, yeah, I can ask him. <coughs> he's, he's nice, so I'll, I'll yeah, ask him. Since we have some new, new people coming on board, so these are <clears throat> annual numbers, <clears throat> annual numbers across the state, right? Correct. There's also some numbers in there that are region-wide, but that I've So when they say 618 fatalities <coughs> across the state, I mean, how do they, how do we know whether we're in or out of so the, the norm? The target is... So the target is to reduce the number of fatalities to 618 um, in year 2020. And then there's a, a, one la a second attachment in your document or in your agenda that has the actual crash numbers in there. And so it looks like the actual fatalities was 632. And so that's what the actual number of fatalities in the state, in the state yes. And then, then for our region, there was 85 fatalities in 2018. So we're looking to reduce our contribution, so to speak, to that number. Correct, yes. Yes, our human sacrifices. <laughs> we want to reduce that number. Yes. Yes, so that we can... Reduce the total number. Reduce the total, right. Correct. Quick question. With our 85, yes. within PPACG's region, is that all roads, meaning federal highways, state highways, all things combined, or are we excluding interstates because they're federal? No, it includes the interstates. It does include interstate yes. travel. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I have a question on the data and why we're having a problem with that. Is that a statewide issue? Is that a El Paso County issue on the data collection? It's not statewide. There is a couple of areas that have it, and we, it's mainly between Colorado Springs and the system that they use and the Re Department of Revenue that receives that data. So every um, pu uh, police department in the, and whatever the state you know, officers, they have to submit their data to the Department of Revenue. And how that usually happens is by a digital download and that happens through a software program. And it's not all the same software programs across the state. And so our software program is not correctly um, uploading or uploading that data from our department, our police department, to the Department of Revenue. And so it was only recently figured out that that was an issue within the last year. And so they're working with the police department and the Department of Revenue to try and get that fixed. But they said it might be a couple years. And don't ask me why. <laughs> I do not know. Um, but unfortunately, that's, it's, it's a data software issue. Do we know if it's also a, a, a financial issue? I have not been told it's a financial issue. But I don't know for sure. If, if we have a briefing from CDOT again like we did last year, I would be particularly interested to know how this data results in actions. Okay. I mean, it's, it's one thing to have a stockpile of data and say, oh, there's a problem area over there. Mm -hmm. But like anything that happens with traffic, um, pinning it down on a causal factor as opposed to a um, correla correlation uh, may be a little more difficult. So it would be mm -hmm. interesting to know whether it's produced significant changes in design of roads because of some things. We hear that in this arena. Uh, about some of the projects that are put forward that this is going to increase safety. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the themes that is part of 
of the legislative teams as well, I think, about investment in, and meeting safety requirements. Um, but it would certainly be interesting to know how those things have been handled uh, and produced whatever the outcomes were. Yeah. And or the person I would invite, Jason Nelson, he is, he's the, engi the safety engineer actually is his title. So he looks at that data and then makes suggestions to others, uh, you know, like the division, the regional division office to say these are where our problem areas are and this is how we can, or what we can do to implement it. For instance, the ramp metering was one of the big things he's pushed for safety as well. And so that is that is one of his key jobs, so I'm sure he'd be happy to discuss that. And also along those lines, the point of these performance measures from the federal government is to provide if, guidance on how to track those measures. And if you're not meeting those measures, then statewide they could lose funding flexibility. So for instance, if they don't meet their fatalities or whatever this, the target is, then they have to spend a certain amount of money on safety projects. They can't flex that money to another type of project. So that's where that comes in is to provide, you know, a push for meet your requirement or meet your targets. And if you can't, then we're going to help you meet those targets by, um, you know, putting a condition on them to pick projects that help with safety. And there's already a, lot, a, a safety funding pool that CDOT uses a large portion of for these safety projects. So there is just a pool for safety projects as well. Um, Jim, I'm wondering also if PPRTA might have personnel that would have at least that knowledge of how we, uh, in this region, how we have reacted to the data versus what do we do now to correct that stuff. So um, that would just be somebody in-house even that would come and speak to us. That, I think that's a possibility, and I'm going to be joining that erstwhile group, but I'm seeing a head shake down there. The, the reason, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, the PPRTA projects by and large are set over a long period of time, and to me, if, if we were seeing a trend about accidents and we can pin down a place, and we, can, and we I'm taking a macro we. Um, can focus our research and try to determine why that is a problem spot. The resulting project may or may not need safety funding so much as it could be a regular kind of project that happens to benefit safety in that particular area. That's why I'd like to see problem and something was done over here. That's what, that's what I'd like to see. And I think the public would benefit from that as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And yeah, let's see, there's a couple more questions. Okay. On that PPRTA side, all of their projects are determined when they go to the um, ballot so they can make no changes. They stay within that. There are minor amendments occasionally, but they do not flex to address a change. If, if it's one street over that's having a safety issue, um, that's no longer the ballot issue. So they're very careful about that. And, and certainly that's, uh, that makes sense. I wasn't thinking PPRTA makes the decision so much uh, as much as they've watched that trend over 20 years or 30 years or whatever. What, what does the state do when there's um, safety issues indicated and they would at least have that basic knowledge around this area? If not, okay. Good education, good to know. Sorry. I imagine okay. they get their information from their engineers from each of the jurisdictions that apply for the funding, and they count on their city or county engineers to help identify those problem areas. So it's probably a place. So if I understand it correctly, the software problem is a matching thing or a reporting thing from us to the state, and what the numbers that we're seeing with that drop off and all that that's a result of what the state is not seeing. But can we get the raw data before it goes to the state? Um, I, yes, we could get the raw data from the police department. It takes a lot more um, data analysis <laughs> than it, like it would, because it comes probably digitally, like on a PDF form, and so someone would have to go through all of that data. So it's a little bit 
harder, but yeah, I think it's possible because the police departments do have that data in the original form. But it's not a guarantee that they are um, filling those out correctly either, though. That's the other piece of it is that it's possible that they might not be identifying serious injuries correctly. And that's the piece that's the problem is the serious injuries, not the fatalities. So. Yeah, the fatalities are pretty straightforward. Yes. I mean, you have that. The serious injury part would be the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you happen to know what the number is for the non-automobile um, uh, piece of it? Like the people that are bikes or pedestrians. Do you know what that is for our region? Yes. Combined fatalities and serious injuries are, I do have them broken um, down in another sheet, but not this one, uh, are 27 fa uh, serious injuries and fatalities. Do you, but do you have that broken out by serious injury and fatality? Mm -hmm. uh, I do, just not, probably not with me. Let me check my, what I did in the spreadsheet. Let's see that. Where is it? So on one of the um, the slides, PPACG, PPACG crash trends. Oh, it doesn't break it out there either. Yeah, I can send it out to you. I, I do have it in a spreadsheet. What yeah, the fatalities yeah. are, bike individually and pedestrian individually. It's all broken out, but I just didn't put it in here. So basically, in our state, four people a day die, right? Uh, in yes. our region, that would be uh, in our in just in our region because it's six hundred and whatever for the state, and then for the oh sorry, I thought you were doing the this. other piece. It's six hundred something yeah. too. So basically, two a day, and that's acceptable to us as a society to have uh, four people a day. It's not, and people are working towards it, <laughs> <laughs> working okay. towards you know with safety. Um, there's and that's the other thing I was going to mention is we're part. Um, one of our other planners, Jason, is working with the police departments and with El Paso County and CDOT. They're working towards a committee to help identify problem areas and are not working towards committee. They have the committee <laughs> that are working towards finding problem areas, what can be done. Um, the county just is putting together a safety plan to help identify those areas there specifically. So there's a lot going on safety-wise in addition to just creating these targets um, that are federally required. We're going beyond that. The um, CDOT has come up with a zero fatalities um, goal. Is their actual long-term goal? So it's it's definitely out there, and there is concern. How can they do zero when you have the DUIs and the idiot factor out there? It's definitely an aspirational goal, and it's... I mean, I think there's some things we're never going to be able to control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. can't cure stupid. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, <coughs> something to ask CDOT when they are here. <laughs> so once they're all uh, self-driving cars, then the people can be intoxicated in the cars. And yeah, there you go. That may be a way off. <laughs> So okay. this is information item, and I'll bring it back for action the next month. Yeah, we don't need any vote on this, just information. Any other questions? Thanks. So it's not that we don't want to see you, Catherine. It's just... But I finally get to sit down. You finally get to sit down, <laughs> right. Um, next thing on the agenda is member discussion. Um, anybody got anything? Any wild parties going on or anything? Yep. The last Social Security 101 of 2019 is being held next Thursday, December the 12th, from 4 to 6 p.m. That is available as a webinar. So if you know anybody who might be coming up on Social Security age or is involved in that age or might have questions, um, we have one of our great Social Security regional folks who sign signs on and presents information and is there to answer questions. So that registration and information on that is ppacg.org slash events. When on the 12th is that? December the 12th yeah. from 4 to 6 p.m. 4 to 6, okay. Um, so if you have folks who you know who might be interested, please feel free to share that with them. Pretty, pretty, please.
I know when I was coming up on that age, a long time ago, um, I did a lot of research, and it's it is uh, some of it's ordered, but it's also kind of confusing if you don't uh, know the lingo and look at all the plans. Right. Any other? Yeah. On that, um, what is the minimum age? Sixty-two. Um, <laughs> Sixty-two for Social Security, but sixty-five for Medicare. That's the important part. So, and, and the class I'm talking about is just Social Security. Okay. So, and that one, one of the things that we the class offers is kind of guidance as you're approaching that age. So for it's really focused for folks probably in the 55 plus range. Um, so the folks who are approaching it and need to know how to handle it in the most effective and financially <coughs> secure way. So if you're getting mailers from AARP, <laughs> you're probably going to be interested in them. All right, um, items for the next CAC other than the safety, we want to get the safety person here. From CDOT. Actually, I Camera. don't know if it's a member discussion or items for next CAC. It, might, it could be both. Is that I sit on the CTAB board, the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board, which just represents Car Springs. And Mountain Metro brought up at the last CTAB meeting that the, the aging um, organization here might be taking over the uh, facilitating ba basically the mobility. For, for those who need uh, extra assistance in, in transportation. Is that true? That is a conversation taking place between Mountain Metro Transit and the Mobility Coordinating Committee, as well as PPACG and the Area Agency on Aging. Um, I would love to know whether that's true or not yet, but nobody does. Mm -hmm. The conversations are going on. And we will have that item and that discussion as soon as decisions are made and we know any actual information on it, it will come to the CAC. So, so is that something, and I understand not let go, why they uh, want to let go of that responsibility. I also understand why they're taking, but even that, that part of it also basically don't want to take on that responsibility. I also know why they see that gave up that responsibility, so you have three employees who are going to not want to take on that responsibility. And I'm, do you need to address like, what the, the folks who are in need of those services, how they feel about it, and how that's going to be handled? And I guess one of my biggest concerns is during during this time when you guys are having this conversation, then you have something to say that it might take a while. How how is it being handled? Is it being handled appropriately? Is not much of pretty much said we can't afford to do, it, do this anymore. And so while all three of you guys are arguing about it, well, and who's taking care of it? So I'll chime in. Um, the, the statement that PPACG doesn't want it, not accurate at all. Okay. Um, which is why we're such an active participant in it. Um, it is. Uh, very high priority for a lot of our leadership is to ensure that transportation options and mobility options for seniors as well as those with disabilities um, continue to be addressed. Pretty much right? Question. Uh, within the last 18 months to two years, we had a big <laughs> briefing and discussion about the consolidation of transportation coordination. How does this does this relate to that at all? And what what happened? Did it, that all collapse? Which is a silver key program, but I'm guessing that's phasing out if they're discussing. Are you talking about the software program 
No, we got no, the this was going to be a big deal coordinating center and people could call About in. Where you call to get a ride. Yeah, you right. could get a ride right. and they were going to coordinate <clears throat> Fountain up to... Yeah, I think we're I talking, talking about the same thing. Your place, Terry, but, you know, they were going to coordinate an awful lot of stuff and it was a big deal and Silver Key was getting slammed. Uh, this never happened. It never happened? I'm making Catherine pop in real quick. <laughs> So while I think that has been a little bit a part of the discussion, this is a discussion mostly on 5310, which are federal transit dollars, and who is going to be the designated recipient and, um, and group that will provide those funds to member different um, participating organizations. So it's specific talks about 5310 and who will be the designated recipient and w whatever comes along with that, which is making sure that you meet the federal requirements. And so that's more specifically what it's about rather than the call center. So that's a separate conversation. We were looking at vendor pricing, I remember, and what was the most effective vendors and the pros and cons of each vendors. And I will say that we were all under the impression that things were moving along and mm -hmm. we had streamlined that process and those in need of that transportation needs were being met. And now I just found out last month that it's not. And I'm kind of just disappointed. We did yeah, complete the one ride um, base step one, which was to make it so that there was one phone number you could call that would help you get your ride. The part of it that stayed in play and was not accomplished was setting it up as a system so that by putting your request in, it automatically sent it to everybody to see who can help you the fastest. Um, instead, instead of the customer needing to call each place and the Call or, center, or call it their favorite place. place. Yeah. So that was that was the big dream that everybody wanted, um, but because it required every single provider to switch to the same system, um, it has not been accomplished yet. Okay, of course. Just a, a real small um, picture of how all that worked. Um, I sit on the front desk every Wednesday morning here. Uh, for the Medicare uh, counseling section, and we get calls in that they need a ride to a medical appointment. And for the first time in the seven years that I had done that uh, particular task, a year ago, the, all that started to work and to flow. And people would uh, call one ride, and we never got a call back saying, I'm sorry, they couldn't help us over there. So it was extremely successful suddenly, uh, but you're describing now what evidently has taken place and, w and I don't know what the current situation is, but it really had, uh, one ride had worked really well temporarily. So what was discussed here uh, had an effect, had a positive effect. And one ride still to this day um, is really helpful for some citizens and in, in a lot of great ways. I'm, I'm going to stare at someone who I think is actually a better understanding of it than I do, so. Uh-oh. So I think then going back to what may be the next, you know, agenda item is what do we need to do as a citizens advisory committee as far as I understand the different ZDOT, KPACG, and Mount Metro has to have this conversation. Are you guys looking for any kind of feedback from the community on what has worked and what hasn't worked, sounds like, and what do you guys, are you guys interested in getting any citizens' feedback is, is my question, and, and our feedback really in that, in that sense as well, or is this just really just a different 
different agencies talking about it and, and figuring out who, who, ha who gets this responsibility and who doesn't. And we'll ha I'll have to bring John Leosatos, our division director, in to talk more about that because he's been more directly involved. So I think he's the best person to answer your questions. Um, but I will say that we've, we're just closing out or getting it at the tail end of a specialized transit um, study that will go into this long range plan that is going um, in January 2020. And so Coming out of that is a bunch of stakeholder meetings and discussions with stakeholders around the region, not just the government entities, but also the organizations that receive these funds. So a lot of the comments from that were kind of involved in this kind of discussion as well. So I think part of that has, part of this has come from those discussions in that study. So there has been citizen um, input, okay. but I am, but I, I'll talk to John and see what he can <laughs> bring to the table. But I think it'd be an interesting item for the next CAC meeting just to get a status of the discussion. Where are we at? Has anybody stuck up their hand and say, yeah, we want to own it? Or has anybody stuck up, taken down their hand and said, no, we don't want to own it, so it's going to go somewhere? But I think we just need to be abreast of the status of the discussions. Well, I think, too, it would be interesting to hear whether <coughs> downward directed initiative collapsed essentially through turf protection of the individual providers because that's that's what it's starting to sound like to me if 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 i mean this was this was being directed downward yeah downward. if i remember right some of the cost analysis figures that we got from the different providers are pretty starkly mm -hmm. different yeah and I understand that, you know, we've got providers that we pay and we have providers that are purely volunteer based. So you you got the two different mixtures of ser service servers, right? People providing the service. And it seemed like, and I'll just use Silver Keys as an example, that, you know, they, they're very specific about who they want to pick up and transport. And so the one call, I guess, wasn't working all that well because they see Silver Keys right there, and they're the perfect person, but Silver Keys says, and I'm just using Silver Keys as an example, great organization, um, <laughs> but basically they were saying, oh, no, we don't serve, they don't fall within our service parameters, mm -hmm. and therefore we can't. So then the send call center would have to <coughs> try and identify several others. So it was very inefficient. So I guess my hope is whoever takes it on helps it to become efficient helps and works through some of these hurdles and really even just dictate to the vendors, hey, and even the volunteers like Silver Key say, hey, if you're going to participate in this, these are some, these are our criteria. This is who we serve. And we can't allow picking and choosing of, you know, smelly person versus not smelly person, you know, kind of a thing. That just can't happen. We have to serve our community equally to everyone based on their need, not based on who I want to serve at that time. Right, but uh, every know. service provider may not have the capability in their van for um, wheelchairs or um, you know special needs people to lower the whole uh, thing down and that kind of stuff. So, but we have to have an ability for mobility for everybody. Yeah. So we'll have this discussion at a future CAC meeting. <laughs> as an as the item you have requested, we'll talk about it. Sharon Thompson, Fountain City Council and PPCG board member. Um, I would like to throw out maybe the possibility that you invite some of the service providers to your meeting or have a joint meeting with MCC. I think that's where you're going to find um, a lot of your specialists in this area, and I think you'll find a lot of your questions do get answered. Um, I, you know, there, you know, nobody's going to say there hasn't been some turf stuff going on, but I just think uh, when you're dealing with people and you're asking them to give up information, they want certain um, uh, confidences and what's going to happen to it and I don't think those confidences were there so I think they've worked really hard to try to get some of this worked out um, and and then you have within that you have closed systems such as goodwill you have open systems you have ADA systems so it is it's a very complicated issue but I think we can all learn from each other and so potentially Jessica extend that invitation might be a suggestion for the board um, we are I always learn a lot with joint meetings when I have them with people because we're all moving towards the same ultimate goal so okay. thank you all right, um, did we beat that down?
Good. Uh, the the uh, item number eight, the meeting and event schedule. Something in there. It's in your calendar. You'll you'll have noticed that in your packet, I had the dates for Christmas and Christmas Eve wrong. Um, I was born blonde, um, so I fixed it in the one the board members got. So, yet, yet another amendment to the whole. Okay, is that it? Not hearing any more or seeing any more. We're done. And now I'm going to chime in. You'll notice that several of our board members have joined us. So hopefully all of you still are, are not anxious to get out of here. Our Chair Norm Steen, um, Sharon Thompson, as you saw, Council Member Yolanda Avila, and... Andy Pico are all here and take some time, chat with our board members, chat amongst each other. Happy holidays. Oh, and if you if you try the eggnog that I brought, take a small cup unless you're really good at high density rich food. So 